If we want to evaluate the efficacy of a new treatment, such as a drug or vaccine, against a particular deadly disease, then it's not enough to focus purely on how effective the treatment is at stopping the disease. We also have to consider the trade-off between effectiveness and safety. While the treatment might stop people dying from the disease, are there possible adverse reactions from the treatment that result in people dying of other causes? So do the risks outweigh the benefits? The simplest and most objective way to do this is to determine whether fewer people who get the treatment die compared to those who don't get the treatment. In other words, we have to compare the all-cause mortality of the treated versus the untreated. Is the treatment saving more people than it's killing? Let's consider a hypothetical example. Imagine there's a new treatment for lung cancer, and in a controlled trial of 2,000 lung cancer patients, 1,000 get the treatment, and 1,000 get a placebo. After six months, we look at the number who die from lung cancer. In the treatment group, 2 out of the 1,000 die. In the placebo group, 20 out of the 1,000 die. Then it seems the treatment is highly effective. 10 times as many people who don't get the treatment die of lung cancer than those who do get the treatment. Formally, effectiveness is defined as 1 minus the percentage who get the treatment who die of lung cancer divided by the percentage who don't get the treatment who die of lung cancer times 100. So when we plug in the numbers here, that's 90%. So the treatment is considered a great success, easily surpassing the usual 70% threshold for such trials. But we also have to consider the adverse reactions. How many people in each group die from other causes than lung cancer during the same period? So suppose in the treatment arm, 26 people die of other causes, making the total of all cause deaths 28. But in the placebo arm, only four die of other causes. So there are 24 all-cause deaths in total. Then the all-cause mortality is higher in the treatment group than in the placebo group. So the risks outweigh the benefits because the treatment is killing more people than it's saving. Now it's important to note that we should really be doing this analysis for each different type of population. For example, there might be categories of people, such as in particular age groups, or particular stages of disease for whom the benefits outweigh the risks. Either way, the method enables us to make informed decisions about who should and should not take the treatment. This approach is especially relevant to evaluating overall efficacy of COVID vaccines. Here, we have to compare all-cause mortality of the unvaccinated against the vaccinated, where the latter is anybody who has received at least one jab because adverse reactions are most likely to happen shortly after vaccination. Now, usually, mortality rates are measured by deaths per 100,000 people. Focusing first on COVID deaths, if COVID is as deadly as claimed, and if the vaccination is as effective as claimed, then we should see a lot more deaths in the unvaccinated than in the vaccinated. But on the other hand, if the vaccine is as safe as claimed, then for non-COVID deaths, there should be only a few more through adverse reactions in the vaccinated compared to the unvaccinated. So when we add the unvaccinated COVID deaths and the non-COVID deaths together, and the vaccinated non-COVID and COVID deaths together, we get the totals of all cause deaths in each. And we expect the net effect to be more deaths amongst the unvaccinated than the vaccinated. By focusing only on all-cause deaths, as we've done here, we completely bypass the problem of defining what constitutes a COVID case or a COVID-related death. And these definitions are easily manipulated to fit different narratives. If the vaccine is effectively mandated for all age groups, then we expect in each age group the all-cause deaths in the vaccinated to be lower than the unvaccinated.